So Friday afternoon came and I realized I had a pile of work to do and it had to get done by the end of the, of the week. And I was just thinking like, oh, I really don't want to do this work. Um, I don't really feel up to it. I can't be bothered. Uh, I'm sure some of you have f had that experience before, right? Where there's a job you got to do, you're either doing a job at work or it might even be a chore that you have to do at home. And you just feel like I can't be bothered to do this right now. And how do you respond? Well, there's a number of ways, right? Yeah, sometimes we just, sometimes we're like, I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to do that job. Um, other times we're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to plow through, but, but I end up doing it with attitude, right? And, and the job actually ends up being more painful, right? Because <laughs> you're doing it, you're being grumpy about it. And other times uh, what might happen is that... Um, you do the job, but but the reason why you do the job is because we're thinking other people will notice that I haven't done this work. So then I'm going to look bad. So I, I do it to look good in their eyes. Or other times it might be like, you know, someone will be fed up with you and, and we're like, OK, I'm just going to do this job anyway so that I get in their good books. And all of these responses are not ideal responses. OK, and but on Friday afternoon, I got really helped out by the Bible because I'd been earlier in the week studying Ephesians chapter six, verses five to nine. And from it, I've been learning um, a more biblical work ethic, a more biblical way to approach work. I found it really helpful. And so I was able on Friday afternoon to apply this to myself. And I'm hoping by sharing it with you today, this is going to help you whether you're working for your boss or whether you're doing chores at home that you need to do. I'm hoping that this will be a blessing for you. So first, let me pray. Lord God, as we look at your word, please help us so that these words actually change our mindset and change our lifestyle so that we can bring glory to your name. And we pray that Holy Spirit, you would help us apply these words to our life and that by your strength and your empowering that we would be changed today and become more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're starting off at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. We're just following on from where we got up to last time as we worked our way through the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. And in Ephesians 6, verse 5, it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Now, uh, at this point, we have to do a quick detour because the word slaves has come up and most of us when we think of slaves we would either think today of the modern um slave trade in that's in in the uk okay um or we would think of transatlantic slavery that started 400 years ago and so it's important that at this point we're just like well hang on a minute is paul talking about that type of slavery and does Paul, the Apostle Paul, and the New Testament, or the whole of the Bible, condone slavery? And we haven't got enough time to deal with everything about this, but I, I do want to show you something, because I've heard people say, oh, the Bible doesn't condemn slavery. And look at 1 Timothy 1, 9, and verses 9 to 11. So Paul said elsewhere, in a letter to Timothy, he said, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, for slave traders, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel. So Paul himself said that slave trading was out of order. People should not be slave traders. Um, so right there, you've got Paul actually criticizing the slave trade and he's criticizing the ancient slave trade which was a different type of slavery to transatlantic slavery 400 years ago there are some similarities but there's some massive differences as well notice also philemon verse 15 when paul's writing to philemon about one of his slaves onesimus he says 
Perhaps the reason he, that's Onesimus, was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. So Paul was actually saying, look, your Onesimus was one of your slaves, but I want you to see him now as a brother. I don't want you to see him as a slave. I want you to see him as a brother. And did you know that in the 1700s in America, um, African slaves were writing letters to the powers that be saying, will you release us from slavery because you guys are saying that you're Christians and the Bible says that we're supposed to treat one another as brothers and we're supposed to carry one another's burdens. So the way we're treated as slaves means it's impossible for our slave masters to love us as brothers or to carry our burdens. And they used Ephesians 5 and they used the the verses we've looked at already about marriage and about family life. And they said the way slavery operates in this country We can't obey those verses because slavery has destroyed the family unit. So I I just say that as some quick arguments to say that actually the Bible is against slavery. And uh, I know you could find people will find verses to quote from the Old Testament and try and say, aha, well, we just haven't got time today to go into that. I'm just presenting you with something very quick at the very least, trying to show you that um, African slaves in North America in the 1700s saw Ephesians and the rest of the New Testament as an argument against slavery, okay? And that also means that what, what what we're reading here today, we don't have the equivalent of first century slavery in the UK. Um... There was a variety of how slaves were treated, but some slaves w- would would kind of the way their lifestyle was. You could kind of, in some ways, one scholar, um, S. M. Bao, has linked it to serving in the military today. Like if you were to serve in the army, and the way that your boss would say you got to do this and you got to do that, and you weren't in control of your own timetable and everything. Um, so. Um, What I'm going to say today is that in our church family, not many of us are in that situation. But if what Paul's saying for slaves back then applied for slaves back then, how much more can it apply for us today when we're working for our bosses or when we're doing chores in the home? And with that preamble, let's move on. So Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 5, slaves obey your earthly masters. So he's telling them, he's saying, do the instructions of your earthly masters, what they've told you to do. Well, for today, this, this means for us, if you've got a boss, right, and your boss tells you to do something, you're supposed to obey as long as it fits in two criterias, if we're going to apply it to the workplace today. First one, does it fit your job description? Okay, your boss can't actually get you to obey something that's not in your job description, right? Um, Secondly, is your boss trying to get you to do something that goes against the Bible? Because if he or she is, then that's off key and you shouldn't obey in that case, okay? Um, But in general, our default position should be, yeah, let's do what our bosses tell us um, to do. And Um, I know that we all have difficulty with this over time. There's plenty of times where we think, well, I don't agree with my boss. I think his idea is stupid. He's told me to do this thing, and I think that's a waste of time. I'm not going to do it. But the Bible actually says, no, do what they tell you to do. And then he says, he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Now, that's how the NIV 2011 has translated it. But other translations translate the Greek behind this as with fear and trembling. And you find that around the Bible, this phrase with fear and trembling. And I think this whole idea of fear and trembling, it's possible that it might mean a a, a mindset, an attitude to have when we do stuff before God. So, for example, Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, 
not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul's saying there, the way you live your Christian life, the way you want to become more godly bit by bit, more like Christ bit by bit, right? That not just when I can see you, but when I'm away, when the only person who can see you is God, do that with fear and trembling. Now, I think what this means is that there's supposed to be this sense of God can see what I'm doing right now and I'm supposed to do things right, but I could very easily do things wrong because I'm a sinner and God could very easily just destroy me. But because of what Christ has done at the cross, there's no anger left for me. So God won't destroy me, but he's powerful and holy enough to destroy me because of my sin. So then we have this reverence for God. We have this respect for God, right? And it's like the opposite to being cheeky, the opposite to being cocky, okay? So what this means is that when we obey our bosses, when they tell us to do something, we're not supposed to be cocky back to them. We're not supposed to be cheeky back to them and notice also paul says slaves obey he calls them earthly masters we see the relevance of that in a sec with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey christ you see this is the point i think paul's bringing out this fear and trembling this lack of cockiness and cheekiness is because when we obey our boss we're actually supposed to take the mindset that we are obeying Christ. So what you've got here is a reframe. If you're not familiar with the term reframe, reframe is when you look at a situation a certain way and you're like, I need to start seeing that situation a different way. So it's a bit like if you had a picture of your work situation, let's say you print it out, a picture of you working for your boss. And you look at it and you're like, I don't like working for my boss. And then you get a lovely gold frame and you put this gold frame around it. And you're like, when I look at that picture now, I see the gold frame. And it makes the concept of me working look much better to me, much more positive. Well, the reframe that Paul's getting us to do here is to say, when you're working for your earthly master, view it as you are actually working for Christ, your heavenly master. So don't think like you're just working for your earthly master. Think you're working for your heavenly master. And if you do that, you're going to approach your work with fear and trembling because you're not thinking so much, am I doing a good enough job for my boss? You're thinking, am I doing a good enough job for Christ? And Paul says, he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. So when he says with sincerity of heart, he means be sincere about your work. Don't be fake. It's not sometimes we can fake it, can't we? We're doing a job for someone and we try and act like we're into it when really deep down we're like, I think this is a waste of time. This is just stupid. And Paul's saying, don't be like that. Okay, well, well, how do you not be like that? Well, it means that when we feel this way, instead of just focusing on putting on a front and like putting up a mask in front of to give the wrong impression or what we think is the right impression that they want. Instead, we say, I'm going to deal with what's going on in my heart because I need to now be obeying Christ. And if I do this job for Christ then actually I will have sincerity of heart because I'll be like, I want to do this for my Lord and Savior. And so he then goes on to say, linked to this, verse six, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. So we can all identify with this, right? He says not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, You know, uh, we've all been there. You're doing a job and suddenly your boss turns up and you do your job better. Yeah. I used to have a job where what I would do to earn more money, I wouldn't take a lunch break and I would eat sandwiches during my work. And what I would do is I would put my head under the desk 
to take a sandwich out of my bag and then I would take a bite of the sandwich and then put the bag back down and then get back to work. And then a bit later, under the table, take another bite of a sandwich. And I was like, well, my boss can't see me. Of course, what, what I didn't know is my boss could see me. And one day I bend down, I go take a bite of the sandwich and this voice behind my head says, what are you doing? And it was my boss and he'd spotted me and I felt terrible. Why did I feel terrible? Because he saw me. Isn't it interesting? I didn't feel terrible all the times I did it that he didn't see me. I didn't think this is a bit unethical. I'm not supposed to be eating at work, but I am eating at work. Um, so this is how we are. We, we will work harder when our bosses can see us, right? And when they turn away, when they leave the office, when they leave the factory floor, we then don't work as hard, okay? Unless you're on a machine line and then you kind of have to work as hard or the machine is going to explode. Um, but so what this means is if you find that when your boss turns up, you work harder. And when people can see you doing stuff, you work harder. This is a sign. This is a sign to let us know that we're not actually working for Christ, that we're actually trying to work um as people pleasers to look good in front of our boss but not really with sincerity of heart for christ so take that as a sign take it as an opportunity to be like oh i need to reframe and get my heart right because he says obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you but as slaves of christ doing the will of god from your heart so Again, this reframe where we say, okay, I'm not really working for my boss. I'm actually working for Christ. I'm going to reframe it that way. And I'm actually doing the will of God. He tells me to obey my boss. So even though I think some of the things my boss says are a bit of a waste of time, a bit of a waste of effort, I'm, I'm actually going to do them from my heart because I'm going to do them for God. Now, what this means is that if someone was to ask you, who do you work for? One way we could actually answer that is to say, I work for Christ. And no matter who we work for, whatever we do for them, we should be doing for Christ. And Paul says in verse 7, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. So not begrudgingly, but really putting your whole heart into it, serving the Lord. Verse 8 because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. That is quite amazing, isn't it? Work wholeheartedly, doing your job for God, and you will get paid back. So when we're in a workplace, we are working to get paid at the end of the week or at the end of the month right or at the end of the day and we work and we're like well i'm working to get this money a lot of times that can be the only reason why we're working to pay the bills but god says at the same time do your work wholeheartedly for god you're going to be rewarded one day jesus is going to come back one day and reward you now isn't that wonderful motivation for working wholeheartedly for putting our all into our work, for obeying the instructions our boss gives us. It's actually quite amazing to think, not only do we get paid <laughs> in this life, but there's actually rewards to come later for whatever good we do. So every time we get frustrated with work and we think, oh, I can't be bothered with this, one of the things we can do is remind ourselves, I'm actually going to get rewarded for this work. This is an amazing deal. And then in verse 9, Paul addressed the masters. He says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So masters of the home who had slaves in those days sometimes would threaten their slaves, threaten them with beatings so that they would do their work. And Paul's saying, don't threaten them. 
And today in the workplace, there are ways that bosses threaten people. Um, there are bosses who are verbally abusive. There are uh, bosses who are physically abusive. There's boss, bosses who will berate people. You know, there, there's even in church situations, there have been pastors who amongst their staff, whenever a staff member does something they don't like, they berate them publicly make them feel terrible it's it's a type of threat that then everyone else is like oh i better not go against what they say because i get berated publicly paul saying don't be like that don't threaten them and he says since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him so he's reminding people with power he's saying look the people that you have authority over they belong to God. God is their heavenly master and God is your heavenly master. And God doesn't look at you and say, well, you're the boss. You're allowed to threaten people. And I think this is really important for us to get this no favoritism thing, because a lot of people think that when they're in a position of authority, that it gives them some kind of preferential treatment, that they are allowed to be a certain way with people in terms of favoritism. So for example, in the UK, we know that um, um, there is favoritism in the workplace. Women in general are paid less than men, right? Um, Ethnic minorities in the UK in general are paid less than white people, even though they have the same job. And in the workplace, in terms of in meetings, Women are often interrupted by men. Often their ideas are ignored. Or if their ideas are taken, often men will take a woman's idea and pretend it's his own idea. The same way studies have been done, which shown that often in the workplace, that ethnic minorities are often talked over and interrupted in meetings. Um, and that white people in meetings get more time to speak and they're listened to more this is favoritism and paul saying there shouldn't be favoritism god's not like that so what that means is for any of us who find ourselves in positions of authority we want to work against the trend that there is in the uk we want to work against the favoritism that there is and you might be used to the favoritism and you might think well that's just the way it is But the Bible says to us, listen, there is no favoritism with God. Let's not be like that. Okay, let's wrap this up by just thinking about the whole story through the Bible of work. Right at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, it almost starts off with work. Um, I mean, you've got God who works to make the world. Right. So we know work isn't a bad thing because God was doing it. And then in Genesis 2.15, it says the Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and take care of it. This was before the fall. Okay, this was before they ate the fruit. So that means that work is a good thing. And the idea of Adam being in the garden and working is a good thing. The idea of us working is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Work isn't from the fall. But work has got tainted by the fall. Work is harder and our approach to work is often wrong. Okay, so an example of that, we see that with King David. Yeah, You remember there was a time of year when the kings would go to work. They would go to war. And some of you know the story. David stayed at home, took a holiday when he should have been going off to work. And then he ended up abusing Bathsheba. Okay, so what we see in the Bible is that work gets messed up. We do work in the wrong way. And that's one of the many, many, many reasons why Jesus then came 2000 years ago and died on the cross. It was to get us back on track with work. It was to rescue us from doing the devil's work. It was to bring us back to God's plan to do God's work of spreading his loving rule. And it was to pay for the price for every time that we've done work the wrong way, for every way that we've worked for the devil and his kingdom instead of for God's kingdom. And what that means is that right now, 
Jesus gives us the forgiveness. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us a new heart so that we can work the way he wants us to. And it's all pointing to that day when he's going to come back. He's going to come back. He's going to bring about the new heavens, the new earth. He's going to reward us for all the good work that we have done for him. And then we are actually in the new heavens, new earth going to be working. But it's not, it's not going to be, you might have suddenly been like, boy, I don't want to be working, but it's going to be good work. It's going to be work without any sin. You're going to find you take great pleasure in it, great joy from it. You're going to be working with people who aren't sinners. You're going to be working with God. It's going to be incredible. And it's also going to be a time of rest as well. I don't know exactly how that's going to work out, but I know it's going to be good. It's going to be fantastic. So now is just a time for us, like we're going to have to do regularly, to reframe the way we view work and to ask God for forgiveness for all the ways we don't work properly and to get the right motivation for why we do work. Let's go to him in prayer now. Lord God, please forgive us of all the ways that we've had a bad attitude about work, that we might have not done the work we're supposed to do. Um, Forgive us of our sin. Help us, God, to do work as unto you more than how we do it for other people. Help us to not be people pleasers who just do work when people can watch us. Help us be people that every bit of work we do, we're motivated by wanting to serve you, our true king. For those of us in positions of authority, help us to use our authority well. Help us all to not show favoritism in the work that we do. Help us to honor you. And we thank you, God, for that day when we're going to be with you in the new heavens and the new earth with our rewards and working with you and working with one another without sin. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.